Hello, how are you doing? As you probably know, I love bookshops and I love looking at lists of books. And so I thought a fun activity uh, to do uh, since every year uh, Waterstones have started doing this book of the year thing and they almost run it like a book prize thing where uh, early in November they announce a short list of their best books of the year. And uh, at the beginning of December, I think, they announce what their winner is and what is declared their best book of the year. And so I thought a fun thing to do rather than just look at this list online would be to actually go to Waterstones and one of my favorite bookshops of Waterstones Piccadilly and actually do a kind of like scavenger hunt to go around the bookshop and see if I can find all the books and actually look at them because a lot of these books include illustrations and stuff or they're beautiful editions and so I want to actually hold the book in my hands and have a look at it and uh, so I I thought I'd make a video talking about how I went to go do that and, and show some footage of when I went in the shop. Now, before you get on my case, I'm fully aware that Waterstone's lists of their books of the year is probably more a kind of like marketing strategy rather than, you know, a big group of booksellers getting together to all vote for their best books of the, the year. Um, that this is probably more a group of like marketing executives uh, trying to figure out what is going to appeal to the widest possible reading audience and what will people want to buy for their friends and family. Uh, over the holiday period and so you know I'm fully aware of that but at the same time this is just sort of a fun activity and like and also I'm aware that there's lots of other bookshops in London and around the UK independent bookshops I know that Waterstones is like a big chain so this isn't meant to be like an advertisement for Waterstones but it is just literally one of my favorite bookshops to go to since uh, Waterstones Piccadilly in London is um, as they well, at least they claim to be one of the biggest bookshops in uh, Europe and they, they're certainly the biggest bookshop in London because it's spread over six very large floors and uh, so it makes it you know a fun kind of scavenger hunt because there's a lot of the bookshop to, to look through and so of course I like to uh, yeah have a browse through other books as I'm going through and searching for these 13 books which they have picked for their shortlist. So I'm going to go through each of the books and give little descriptions of them and talk about them. And it's very like canny of, uh, I think, bookshops have been coming out recently with special editions of books uh, to, you know, try to sell more copies. But obviously for book geeks like me, it really works because I'm really drawn to these special editions. And just this morning, I saw that Waterstones in Gower Street, which um, used to be a famous used bookstore and sells a lot of academic books as well as like new titles and so um, and they have a, a great sort of uh, section of uh, rare editions and and stuff it's it's a really beautiful bookshop but it was taken over by Waterstones a number of years ago but they've come out with a special edition of Orlando by Virginia Woolf and uh, this is specifically published because uh, Waterstones Gower Street is in Bloomsbury and that's where the Bloomsbury group was, that's where Virginia Woolf lived for a period of time and uh, and so they're coming out with these editions like special to them that they I think are only selling in their bookshop itself so you have to go there in order to get these special editions and, and I'm really tempted because even though I already have a really beautiful copy of uh, Orlando I still want this new <laughs> special edition so it's yeah very canny of them to do that because do I need another edition of Orlando? No, but do I want it? Yes, <laughs> very much. And so, uh, yeah, um, I, I think it's uh, really canny of uh, these booksellers to <laughs> and bookshops and marketing executives or whoever are making these decisions to uh, bring out these special editions. Um, so last year, uh, Waterstone's book of the year was Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell, which won the Women's Prize uh, last year as well. And uh, yeah, was a big like popular bestseller and uh, yeah, and is is absolutely beautiful book uh, in its 
itself. Uh, but yeah, they have 13 books on this year's shortlist, which is yeah quite a long shortlist um, to, to be having. And they're books that range from novels uh, to uh, children's literature, uh, to nature writing, uh, to nonfiction. And uh, yeah, so a big range of titles, but I'm going to go through them all uh, talking first about uh, Clara and the Sun by Kazuo Ishiguro, um, which absolutely was one of my favorite books of the year. It's such an engrossing story told from the point of view of an artificial friend. And, uh, you know, the, the, the first edition itself is like a really beautiful uh, copy. But of course, Waterstones have brought out a special edition of this with a gold spine to it, uh, which is really beautiful. And I do want a copy of it, even though, you know, I already have this copy. So so definitely don't need another one but uh yeah it's it's so um they make it so tempting and uh yeah and, and i just love this story so much i think it's such a riveting tale like in itself just the the story itself following uh the very dramatic uh things that are happening behind and there's a whole like mystery to the story which just draws you through it and, and makes it quite thrilling uh but also it raises a lot of larger questions about what it means to be a human and where we're going in our society and what is the meaning of consciousness and our connection with each other and the meaning of faith and all these big larger questions which it raises and then that I have continued thinking about after finishing the novel but when I was just first reading the novel itself I was really engrossed in the story and so I think it's such an amazing like writing achievement you know in itself and he Ishiguro deservedly award deserves de deservedly deserves all of the, uh, the the attention um he's gotten I know a lot of people you know there there are some readers that didn't respond as strongly to this book and I totally respect that and understand that but uh me personally I I just loved it uh then there is the novel Open Water by Caleb Azuma Nelson um which is a debut novel and is one of the most powerful debuts of this year uh about a young black uh, British couple that that meet and form a friendship and a romantic relationship with each other in modern day London um, they, they've both uh, gone to uh, art, had arts university um, degrees um, one is a photographer one is a dancer and it uh, just gets into the intricacies of their psychological reality you know especially from his point of view it's mainly told through his point of view and it's uh, told through the second person um, it's has this real direct style which um, speaks directly to you but also speaks about more universal subjects um, and yeah and is talking in particular about young black British life in uh, England today uh, but you know is also speaking about more universal social and uh, societal issues uh, in in the world today and it's it's such a, a powerful impactful uh, beautiful story and uh, so yeah I'm glad this is one of their choices. Ariadne by Jennifer Saint. This is a retelling of uh, classical mythology uh, and there's been a lot of these uh, recently uh, so much so that there's a whole like shelf dedicated some to uh, to some uh, mythological retellings from a feminist point of view uh, in, in Waterstones which was sort of uh, funny to see um, but I uh, I think it's great. I totally like welcome uh, this, these like retellings. I mean, you know, for thousands of years, these stories have been told and retold mainly through uh, men's points of view. And so, you know, why not f have a, a few year stint um, where uh, it's focusing more on female characters from these mythologies. And so Ariadne was a uh, princess of Crete that lived in a beautiful palace, uh, but below in the dungeons of that palace dwelt the Minotaur, um, which was a bloodthirsty beast and was also uh, <laughs> uh, Ariadne's uh, half brother. And uh, so, yeah, it gets in to her story of the the story of uh, when uh, Theseus comes to uh, 
visit the palace and tries to destroy the Minotaur and how she sort of teams up with him. It also gets into the story of uh, her sister Phaedra and uh, so yeah it, it sounds like a riveting tale told through a really fun new perspective. Next is a book that really nicely complements uh, that previous novel uh, that I was discussing uh, which is Greek Myths, a new retelling by Charlotte Higgins uh, which comes with illustrations and this is a non-fiction retelling and re-examining of uh, some of the greatest myths but looking through uh, the point of view of the the female characters from these different mythologies and each chapter of the book is sort of organized around a different figure such as Athena, Helen, uh, Circe, and Penelope uh, to uh, tell the stories um, more from their point of view or focusing on what details we know about them and uh, so yeah I think this would be a great sort of complement to, to reading uh, some earlier like editions of the mythologies. Then there is a new nonfiction book looking at different kinds of mythologies uh, which is Storyland, a new mythology of Britain by Amy Jeffs and this is looking at the history and the landscape of Britain through its different mythologies over time and telling the stories of uh, the, the landscape itself and some of uh, the greatest landmarks in the country and uh, why these things are play a such uh, significant significant role in uh, the nation's uh, history and uh, the kind of mythologies um, which surround these different landmarks of how they were created and, and what role they played in uh, the citizens' lives uh, over the years and over time and how this has really formed the modern day identity of what it means to be British. There's a novel which is a literary thriller uh, called The Appeal by Janice Hallett and this is told in a really innovative uh, way where uh, it's a sort of murder mystery um, where in a small village uh, there's a group of um, a theatrical group and someone dies from that theatrical group and someone goes to prison for that murder but there is more to the story than than that and you gradually uncover um, what's happening uh, behind this murder and the the mystery surrounding it but not through straightforward st storytelling uh, but through documents and so you read a number of emails and letters and text messages and through that you piece together uh, what's really going on and uh, yeah I think that's that sounds like I, I don't read all that many literary thrillers um, but uh, this sounds like a fun new way of, of doing a kind of murder mystery story. Now recently I've been reading some more uh, nature writing and really enjoying that um, after following the the Wainwright Prize uh, this year and uh, so I'm glad to see that there's some uh, new nature writing uh, also shortlisted for this and one of the books is Around the World in 80 Plants uh, by Jonathan Drory and Lucille Clerk and uh, so this is a book uh, doing exactly what it says in the title of um, showing you uh, 80 different plants and illustrations of those plants from around the world from the common uh, tomato plant or tomato plant uh, however you want to pronounce it I, I do a sort of mishmash um, of American and British way of pronouncing uh, tomato <laughs> but uh, but also dandelions and Spanish moss and looking at the the history of these plants and their evolution and what these plants and their use in society says about our own history and culture and folklore and so I think it's a really interesting way of looking at the the past of uh, you know these different organic life forms and and how they uh, play a role in our society. There's also a book of travel writing uh, with the Amur River uh, between uh, Russia and China by Colin Thubrun and uh, who's a very famous travel writer and when he was 80 years old he went and followed a river um, from the very origins of uh, this river in the Mongolian mountains uh, all the way down to the, the sea and uh, this is the 10th largest river in the world and he experienced a lot of trials and tribulations along the way I think he was actually even like arrested while he was making this this journey and uh, so it's this sort of discovery of uh, the river itself and uh, the the societies 
kids that live on either side of it. There are also some books of children's literature, and uh, so first off there's a geography book uh, called A History of the World in 25 Cities by Tracy Turner and Andrew Donkin, and uh, so this does, you know, what it says in the title. Again, it looks at the, the world um, through specific cities, and it has illustrations of these cities, not so much a representation of uh, how the city is actually laid out, but through some of its biggest landmarks and what that says about the, the city. And uh, what I really like is uh, how this book seems to go into uh, the story of childhood life in these different cities. And uh, so it seems like a great way of exposing children to different cultures and lifestyles all around the world and, and how children actually live, you know, in everyday life um, in these different cities. There's a middle grade book uh, called Julia and the Shark by Kieran Millwood Hargrave, and it's uh, illustrated by Tom DeFreston. And this is a story about uh, Julia and how she and her parents uh, go to live on a remote island one summer, and her father goes there for work, and her mother goes on this like obsession in a search of the elusive uh, Greenland shark and uh, while she's on this journey she encounters some trouble and uh, Julia sort of has to go after her and, and find out what happened to her um, but also uh, more about this, this shark and uh, it was really lovely when I found a copy of this uh, book on the, the table that it was on. Uh, also nearby there was uh, Anna James' most recent book, uh, my wonderful friend Anna James, um, who had a new book out recently. And I know because Anna's friends with Kieran, um, it's just lovely that they're sharing a table together. There's a young adult novel called They Both Die at the End by Adam Silvera. And uh, this is set, I guess, in a sort of dystopian type society, you know, like a lot of young adult novels. Um, uh, where a uh, organization called Deathcast calls two different uh, individuals, two young men, and tells them that they are going to die today. And uh, so uh, before the end of their day, uh, they go on an app that's specifically for people that know that they're going to die very soon in order to meet each other. And uh, so these two young men uh, meet up with each other and have a day together where they try to fit in all of the events of their life into one single day and have this exchange and form this friendship uh, before they meet their inevitable end. So that, that's, that's quite a like unique idea for a story. Paul McCartney has brought out a big, fancy, really beautiful looking book called The Lyrics, where he goes into all of the lyrics and the songs that he's written over the many, many years of his musical career, uh, going into uh, the, the stories behind them, what inspired them, um, some of his literary influences, and uh, and you see reproductions of some of the documents, of some of the, the handwritten uh, lyrics of, of these songs that that he, he wrote along with a lot of photographs. Um, it comes in uh, two big volumes, uh, all collected in this uh, big beautiful box. And uh, you know, it's a very pricey uh, thing. Um, Waterstones are selling it for 60 pounds. And so uh, I saw somebody commenting on Twitter that if this does win Book of the Year, it's gonna be really tough for booksellers to you know say at the, the till like, like, hey, why don't you give a try to this uh, big expensive uh, new book that's our book of the year. Um, yeah, it's going to be quite a hard thing to push, but uh, but it is a really beautiful object, and I love that they have some copies uh, open out on the tables in Waterstone, so you can have a look and a browse uh, through it, because uh, a lot of the, the copies uh, come in shrink wrap, and so you're not able to open it up, but, but you are able to browse through it in the store. Now, on my little scavenger hunt through the, the bookshop, I did find all of the books, except for one, because, uh, yeah, it's quite a big bookshop and it took me quite a while to find a lot of these these books. I was in there maybe like between half an hour and 45 minutes just browsing around and obviously I was distracted looking at a lot of other books as well but one book I couldn't find uh, and the, the final book, the 13th book uh, on their list, short list for the best books of the year uh, is You Are a Champion by Marcus Rashford uh, who is a footballer and uh, 
uh, became a really big celebrity as he got involved in a, in a campaign in Britain to end child food poverty. And uh, so, yeah, really inspiring uh, great figure and a uh, great uh, individual, uh, but uh, I know nothing about sports or, or football, and uh, so I went up to the sports section in Waterstones for the very first time in my life and felt like a bit of a fish out of water. I'm like, oh, I don't really know how to navigate these bookshelves. And so I looked under football trying to find this book, uh, which uh, then I, because I couldn't find it, I started to question myself like, oh, is Marcus Rashford actually a footballer or does he play some other sport because I, I really have no idea uh, about sports or know anything about him other than this you know great uh, campaign that he uh, that he led and which led to real change in the country uh, but uh, yeah I couldn't actually find a copy of this book and then realized afterwards that this is geared a book geared more towards children and talking about how you can find inspiration because he came from quite like a humble background but then has obviously gone on to be this big um, celebrity and star footballer and uh, so yeah it's meant to be an inspirational book for children uh, but when I was leaving the shop I did actually see it out displayed in the the window of, of the shop so I did find it there but I didn't find a copy a physical copy that I could go look and browse through um, so I obviously should have gone to the ch children's section anyway so um, so I failed the scavenger hunt in that way but I did find most of the books and uh, so yeah it's I thought it'd be fun to actually show copies of them uh, in this video so those are all the books uh, on the list I did make some purchases while I was there but I'm not going to show them on camera because uh, I bought some of these books for gifts for people and uh, so for some friends and family of mine, some of whom I know sometimes watch my video. I don't know if they'll be watching this video, but I don't want to spoil the surprise of giving um, these books as gifts. Um, so yeah, so I'm not going to talk about what books I actually bought while I was there. Uh, but yeah, I did make some purchases and yeah, had a really fun time looking around the, the bookshop. So yeah, let me know if you've uh, read any of these books, if you would recommend them or if you're interested in any of them now and which book you think you should win the book of the year for the Waterstones, you know, for what it's worth. And uh, thank you for watching. Hope you're reading good things and I'll speak to you again soon. Bye-bye.